Esoterica the Podcast. Welcome to Esoterica the Podcast, where we discuss the obscure, offbeat, and unusual. I'm Chris Schultz. And I'm Aaron Christian. Tonight's episode is brought to us by Charles Mulligan Steakhouse, located in Indianapolis, Indiana. Mulligan Steakhouse, home of the Destroyer of Bowels, the Porterhouse, the Enforcer, the Ribeye, recently awarded a commendation for its contribution to the return of the um, Harvest Festival in Pawnee. Mulligan Steakhouse, best damn steak in the best in the damn state. I totally fucked that up. Yeah, great job, Chris. Really kicked ass there. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, this is Esoteric of the Podcast, and thank you for joining us for another episode this fine Wednesday afternoon or morning or evening or whatever. could be Thursday for all I care. It's a day. It's a day. Well, this week we rotate back to me, and we're going to be um, interviewing some people that I know. Um, we're going to be interviewing Nolan and Jake from the Fairview. I used to play with them when I was in Something Saturday, and uh, they we're, were a fun to talk to. But a little bit of background. Um, the Fairview is a band that was started by Nolan McGovern uh, when he was in high school with a couple friends. You know, changed through a few iterations, and they are at their current iteration of their band. They've um, put out, you know, some EPs and stuff that I believe this is their debut L- LP that we're listening to called Fresh Faced and Effervescent. Um, I've been actively listening to this song in the car for a, about a week and a half now, um, and it's quickly becoming my song of the winter. <laughs> song? song song album of the winter oh, thank you it, oh there's one particular song that is my song of the winter but this is the album of the winter right now um and it's a lot of fun to listen to so normally in our episodes i would say hey let's jump to here and listen to them just answer a few questions um but i talked to them for about an hour and 10 minutes and i'm not gonna put the whole episode uh, interview in here and end up you know Spending 45 minutes. So if you want to listen to the whole unedited video, go to Esoteric of the Podcast, the YouTube channel, and you can find the whole unedited video with uh, Jake and Nolan from the Fairview. Um, we're going to get started then, if Chris doesn't have anything else he wants to add. No. The yeah. Fairview, is that a um, golf reference? You know, I well, the fair way. I assume. Is the, oh, yeah. fair way. So never mind. Yeah. I, uh, I've got nothing to add. I'm not, I can't recall if I asked the where did the Fairview name come from question. Um, but uh, hey, Jake Nolan, curious. Answer that question if you don't mind. Um, but anyway, we are going to get into Fresh Faced and Effervescent, and we are going to listen to the first track, which I want to pull up the track list and say correctly is Black Cat, Broken Mirror, and Two Dead Birds. Welcome to another episode of Esoteric of the Podcast. I am your host, Aaron Christian, and joining me are Nolan and Jake from The Fairview, one of my favorite bands from when I used to play in a band a time long ago. <laughs> so thank you guys for joining me. How are you guys doing? Doing pretty well. Good. How are you? Good, good. So what I'd like to do is just go track by track a little bit. Um, I, I've written down some of my thoughts on, on some of this, but I know we're going to talk about it more in the episode. So I really want to hear what you guys' um, um, you know, thoughts or purpose or you know, message behind the song is. Um, some of the thoughts here, I just kind of want to pave the way and you know, just start the discussion on it. So yeah, let's dive right in then um, yeah. to Black Cat, Broken Mirror, and Two Dead Birds. And I kind of interpreted the song kind of like, you know, not being able to control the future, you know, not being able to control what comes next. Yeah, that's that's definitely a, a large portion of it. I think a, a very, very big portion is being resistant to change. Um, like when you know that aspects of your life are shitty like or they're not working, like it's it's a comfortable, like uncomfortable, like it's not really you being happy. It's just you being comfortable in what you're used to. Um, and knowing that if you were to like have to take those steps forward, it would be terrifying. And so you just choose to kind of resist that change that you know needs to come anyway. And I've found that life has a way of initiating that change anyway, eventually, you know, whether or not you go with it. Um, and so the song's like largely about that. It's just like, you know, accepting that, you know, 
everything's going to evolve and adapt and become something new. And like you, you just kind of, you're, you're better off moving with it than trying to like force yourself to stay in one place. Hmm. And, and can I ask where the title came from? <laughs> yes. Yeah. So um, when I first moved to Providence in 2016, um, I love this shit. So what I, yeah, I moved in with like Craigslist roommates uh, in like a one bedroom apartment. I mean, no, no, um, like a few bedroom apartment on Wickenden Street. And uh, when I moved in, I found out that my roommate had a black cat. And I was like, huh. Um, <laughs> when I was moving into my place, I had like a, like a floor mirror. And at some point it just, it got knocked over and it completely shattered my mirror, like full glass mirror on the ground. And then I was walking to my job from like my house to Starbucks that I was working at um, on Thayer Street. And on two separate occasions in the first week of me living there, a, a bird flew into a window in front of me during my walk. So oh my I remember all of this Fucking being hex. very, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember all this just kind of being like, damn, this just feels like really ominous and weird. <laughs> um and like i don't think like, it was bundles of sage in his room at a time yeah i'm like not superstitious but i was like this is fucking weird um and you know i don't think it was like any real like omen or whatever i just think it's kind of like a funny metaphor for like something's coming uh, yeah you know you're, you're not superstitious but a little bit stitious right correct yes yeah. exactly <laughs> uh, <laughs> i knew i'd slip an office quote in somewhere we got it if you don't, what are you doing? <laughs> Switch off losing my religion And doubling down on disillusionment The yard immense, but I'm still picking off Layers of summer's dead skin So I want to apologize because at the end of the last thing I said, we are going to listen to this. And then it went into the interview and that did not happen. So I apologize in advance. Uh, but you had a face like you wanted to say something or something came to your mind. And I'm curious what it is. I have found now on more than one occasion when we're listening to a song by uh, a 20 something band from southeastern Massachusetts that the hat I put on is the the wise old uh, man with advice for the younger generation. Mm. I'm not exactly comfortable in that role yet, but that seems to be where I um, find myself. So, pro tip. Nobody knows what the fuck they're doing. Doesn't matter how old you are. Those of us who are older have experienced things enough time that we can take an educated guess at what the outcome is going to be and act accordingly. But at the end of the day, we're all making it up as we go along. And uh, that's a painful truth for some to realize. Yeah. But it's true. What I love about, you know, these types of songs is that I think they're they're not alone. Like, obviously, a lot of us 20-year-olds, like, even me, like, I'm thinking about it in this time next year, I need to find a job, man. Mm. Like, I'm going to be graduating and that's a scary thought because, like, hey, life starts. Like, this is what you're going to do pretty much until you die or maybe 20 years before you die if you're lucky. Yep. You know? And it, what I appreciate is that they're they're putting that kind of fear forward and saying, hey, like, I, I tried, but, man, I didn't know anything. Like, you know, either I didn't learn it in school or from whatever the atmosphere may be. But Well, see, I think you touch on it there because I think this is part of the problem. Your entire life up until now has had direction that someone else has given you. Now, you are responsible for your accomplishments and where you've gone and what you've done. But there's a track that you've been on that someone else has laid out for you. When you graduate from college, it's all you, bud. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's a frightening thing to contemplate. Now, mm -hmm. maybe you're well prepared and you're on a good track to, to start. Right. Maybe you're not. Maybe you're at a crossroads. Maybe there's no rails at all. But whatever the case may be, you're forging the path going forward. And that's um, 
to quote from these guys that's overwhelming terrifying unrelenting mortifying but it's wonderful and beautiful and perpetual because it's just it's going to yeah. be even if you choose not to engage that's what's happening uh, so what I, one thing i learned from talking to the fair view about this record is that this is all stemmed from a breakup and i wouldn't argue that that's necessarily a breakup song now the next track however i think is probably the only time on the whole record that i'm like yeah that song is definitely a breakup song or about love in general but i think there's an interesting like theme here of you know, it's it's more about just being a twenty year old than it is about, or you know, a thirty year old, or in that range, than it is about you know just the common you know breakup. Mm-hmm. So, um, and especially like there are times it actually gets very specific to living in this area, you know, living in New England. And there was a Duncan reference. There's a Duncan reference. I think at one point there's like a, a nor'easter type of reference. So, <laughs> you know, like it um, it has that feeling. So why don't we before. You know, we spend too much time on every part of this episode. Um, let's jump into the next track, which is called Your Hair in the Rain. So to follow that up is Your Hair in the Rain. Um, and there's one line in here specifically that I, I totally understood, but yet love that I almost didn't. And that doesn't make sense. But um, that specific sense of nonspecific dread, um, you know, I, I, I felt that it kind of hurt feeling it um <laughs> you know and it was almost like there was this sense of like a, a it's almost a relatable breakup song and that was like the one time i felt there was a breakup involved mm. um, but nobody cares what i have to say <laughs> yeah i mean that was definitely <laughs> like the more breakup the breakup song for sure on the record it's like yeah. right out there huh but um yeah um specific sense of non-specific dread i i think you know it was just kind of meant to be like anxiety like or guilt anxiety like the kind of like oh no i'm a fucking bad person like you know oh like how can i be a good person if when i'm doing my best when i'm trying my hardest to be considerate and to be caring i'm still fucking up and i'm still not being the person i need to be how can i consider myself a good person and like it's that kind of dilemma i think was like what i what i personally thought when i wrote it but in general i think it's just meant to be like that dread of being guilt and anxiety and stuff yeah. over stuff. A dream that I detached Ditched my track record and started from scratch on the west coast Threw away my winter coat Cause enough was my favorite song back when we did famous year around The town we grew up in the spoke of ourselves Loving God and all the other things we no longer believed in So there's a line in the song in particular that is um i feel the specific sense of non-specific dread when i ponder intention in how outcome diverges and that line hit me hardcore you know because you ever get that feeling that you know you don't really know where the dread is for you know what i mean or what it's why you have it but it's you it's a very familiar feeling Mm. You know, maybe it's surrounding a certain scenario. For example, like, you know, I've gone through a breakup where, like, I just feel like crap and I feel upset and I can't necessarily point out where or why. Yeah. You know, and then when I ponder intention and, and how come and how outcome diverges, it's like that intention versus the perception kind of thing. You know, what you intended to do and how it ends up being seen. Well, diverging outcomes. Sometimes fills me with dread, sometimes excites me. Um, case in point, the inauguration. Yeah. Um, with what had happened at the Capitol a couple of weeks before that and the chatter that was going around, suddenly there existed the purpose that everything could go sideways on that day. Right. And I remember leaving and going to work and thinking to myself, more than likely, I'm going to come home and think the inauguration will have happened and the world will have moved on. But there is a very real possibility that everything will go insane. Yeah. And a threat that wasn't there before. Yeah. And there's that sense of dread like, how is this going to go? Yeah. It's probably well, going to be fine, yeah. but it might not be. And that's suddenly real. Yeah. Chance? Well, and yeah. this is one of those things where we could probably go off on a tangent. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Because there's, there's so many moving parts to that and this and the other thing. And, 
Um, so recover. Recover. Yeah. <laughs> let's play it safe and stay um, on target. Listen to. I did this again last one. Let's listen to Nolan and Jake talk about recover first. Yes, and then we'll and then we'll, we'll muse listen. and listen and then muse. Yeah, recover. I, I included recover specific because we were going to do an older song. Um, recover is from an EP that we put out in like 2015, I think. Um, and I really wanted to do recover because I thought the themes really did match up, but like from, from very different points in my life. Cause that was like even longer ago, you know, um, with a very, uh, kind of like self, deprecating self I, I don't know like the whole idea of like I don't want to be the kind of person people have to recover from um I think like it's something that's grounded in good intention but ultimately we can't control how we affect anybody like we can uh we like need to be doing our best absolutely but like at the same time like I find a lot of people are just kind of recovering from each other because of their differences and how long they stayed together. Like it's just, it's nuanced and it's complicated. So I liked that having recovered kind of come back because it kind of represented this like moment of like regression almost where it's like, I I feel like a kid, I feel like a teenager and that I'm just angsty and sad and angry and insecure. Yeah. Um, yeah, but no one really revamped the fuck out of that song in, in the studio. <laughs> Like, cause we, cause we had, I, we didn't have like a ton of ideas. Like we like had some ideas, but we didn't, when we went in, there was a lot of like filling around and hit, uh, Nolan and our producer Ian, like went really hard on like the rhythm guitars and the bass for it. So like that, when I came in to do leads, I was like, ah, what is this? I was really <laughs> excited. Well, yeah, when we, so when we made that in 2015 for the first time, I think it was just like straight up drop D power chords. Cause that was, I don't know. That was definitely where we were at as a band at that time. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I just like, yeah, I don't know. My guitar playing style progressed in between those two times and I wanted it. So if we we're going to take recover an old tune and drop it in our newest release, you know, it had to also kind of sonically blend in with the album, not just thematically. So yeah, through some of my big old, you know, um, dad gad, like <laughs> Franken chords in there. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, that. so it, it got a little bigger, a little wider of a song. Yeah. Um, yeah, and definitely, it, it definitely fits in sonically and thematically. Like it, mm -hmm. it, it. I wouldn't have even known because actually, I didn't even know it was off another EP, so I wouldn't have been able to discern that it was um, from a different era at all. Um, yeah, so kudos. that's cool. Cool. Thanks. Um, <laughs> that's good. No, it's really cool to hear. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you know, like first listen, you know, like I kind of walked in, you know, I knew what I was going to expect because, you know, I've, I've seen you guys live. I've heard you guys before. And I, you know, there's this thing, there's this like level of sound I expected, but in a lot of ways I was surprised because it wasn't exactly what I expected it to be. Um, and that's what was really cool about it because, you know, you go in with the perception and you're blown away. Um, so just compliments i like to give those those are fun. <laughs> Do, we, um, we love compliments <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes a, a song hits you in the feels. Was this one of them? It punched me in the feels. <laughs> that first verse in particular. Um, so my first marriage, uh, my wife suffered from TMJ. Oh, my God. I hate that. She grind her teeth at night. I do that. It was the stress of the sham marriage that we were living in. Mm-hmm. And on a similar note, I ended up going to the doctor because I got really bad carpal tunnel syndrome in both my hands. And the doctor was trying to figure out what I was doing that was causing it. And what it ended up being was when we were, he's like, what do you spend most of your time doing? I'm like, we watch TV. The wife and I would sit next to each other watching TV. 
and I would keep my hands underneath my, my arms crossed, like squeezed on my chest. And I was putting so much pressure on my wrists that it was causing carpal tunnel syndrome. Mm. Fucking stress from a, a bad situation. So, boom, like this song just. You know, it reminded me of a, a date I went on one time where, uh, you know, usually we went to the movies, but she was scared. So she brought all of her friends with her. So it was like me and then like 10 other people in her. Oof. Um, it was really, it wasn't a date. Um, but, you know, like on like a first date, you know, maybe like try to hold their hand or something like, you know, something pretty PG. I've never met anybody that hel- held their hands crossed for one hour straight or an hour and a half straight through a movie until <laughs> I met this person. That's like you're completely shut off. Yeah. And so she got up to use the bathroom. Somebody leans over to me. Goes, hey, you should like and I'm like, I'm trying to, <laughs> but I can't. So it was like the it was like the end of the movie. And I didn't know it was the end of the movie. And I lean over. I'm like, do you mind if I? hold your hand she goes fine and oh oh i know right Eesh. and then so the end of it uh, she's like all right do you have a ride home i'm like i drove here <laughs> like i told you i was driving here you know they, she told me to show up at like 2 30 but they had already been there since two and the movie already started like it was just bad from the get-go Oof. so anyway that's a sidetrack um yeah i really like the end of the song there was this like breakdown sort of uh, and the breakdown's a bad example like a halftime sort of feel and I think that um, that was a nice effect and some intensity to the song. Nice. Anyway, mm. our next song is Only Grays. So the next track is uh, Only Grays. Um, and there, I, well, I don't know why Notes is telling me that Grays is spelt wrong. I, I heard somewhere that E is like for Europe and A is for um, America. But screw them. I think uh, <laughs> it super doesn't matter. I guess yeah, I just don't I, care at all. Right. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on. You know what? Pause. It's for what? The E spelling is for what? So Europe. people, in, yeah, in Europe they use the E spelling. In America they use the A spelling, and I don't think they have anything to do with it. But that's just what they do. Uh, Interesting. So, yeah, I knew that. I, I heard it in, yeah. in middle school from some girl that thought she was smart. So, well, just, gotcha. Uh, so who's to say? We've all got Google. We could have looked it up, but we didn't. We could have. I think it's I think it's more interesting uh-huh. to just speculate. Um, yeah, who's to say? You know, who, who really knows? Language. Yeah. It's it's really gray what the what the spelling of gray is. Hey. Um, but anyway, um there the, a line I pulled out of here in particular was uh, I got used to the, lo- the loneliness the same way a body does pain. Um and I that's really good imagery because, you know, I, I, I was actually at work the other day and somebody I work with has a knee brace on. He was trying to explain to me how it felt. And he actually poked me in the arm. He goes, it doesn't hurt you, but you just kind of, it doesn't it just, it's there. You know what I mean? Like it just, <clears throat> it, just it, it hurts, but it doesn't hurt that bad anymore. You know? And, and that's kind of what I related it to. It's just like, yeah, being alone kind of does feel like that when you've done it long enough. Yeah. I think it's easy to get, to just like start to take a certain level of, uh, you know, depression and just like, it's your normal and you're just like walking around, uh, in this just constant state of like, you know, weird dissociation or, you know, all that, like, and, uh, yeah, that's, that song's very interesting because like, it's been about like three different things. I like, we, it was originally going to be on, it could be worse than it is, but it wasn't ready yet. Um, and because it was about a completely different thing and the lyrics sucked, it was, it wasn't ready. Um, but it's wild because then it became like this song about how, like in moments where, you know, things are really tough, like and challenging, you can kind of like turn to a faith that you very much rejected. Mm -hmm. Um, like, you know, not something that you, you are open to in any way, shape or form, but like something you grew up with and it, it like, you, you feel that vulnerability and like you kind of reach out again, but like you're kind of angry at yourself for doing so, you know? And just like, you know, weird complicated feelings and the, like the ways we punish ourselves for just being vulnerable. And um, yeah, it's that kind of song, I guess. Yeah, and I, I really like that, that concept of, you know, when you start to, uh, you know, start to look back at something that you've kind of looked away from before, you know, in times of need, you know, and, and not only speaking maybe of religion, but like in terms of, um, you know, even people, you know, sometimes, you know, you look back at like people that may have treated you bad in your life because you miss certain moments and you feel like you need those again. 
Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. Interesting. Um, interesting. I'm doing a lot of self-reflection as we're talking about it. So that's why I, <laughs> I pause I'm glad, in a moment. I'm glad this is all just like one big therapy session for all of us. I, yeah. I think it's well, great. And that's the beauty of this show is it's called Esoterica. We, we talk about things that are offbeat, unusual, or just left of mainstream. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, there are some people in this world that may have never heard of you guys if they didn't listen to this show, for example. So if this is a big therapy sh session for them, then that's all I wanted. Then hell yeah. inside my room it didn't say much just looked like you reacquainted myself with bare walls after taking your paintings down thumb dots left holes in the drywall but the cold of the nothing now silence used to make sense we shared a comfort we amongst ourselves excellent usage of the word cacophonously yeah i uh you said that and i was like what and i and i looked down I'm like oh there's the word <laughs> it, it's like uh the band live when they use the word placenta i'm like mm -hmm. in the entire human history i don't think anyone's ever sung the word placenta yeah. in a song before way to go well this is a little deeper than that <laughs> but um I'm, I'm looking back at my notes from the interview that i had with them and i'm trying to remember what the point i brought up about this oh yeah the the line um i got used to loneliness the same way a body does pain mm -hmm. and the story i told I, I i guess i won't recap but the the long short is that um there's a guy i work with who's wearing a knee brace and he's trying to explain how the pain feels like it, it hurts me to wear this knee brace but it's not painful it's more just like if i were to poke my finger into your arm and just kind of leave it there like it doesn't hurt, but like it does. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's a pressure. Kind of get used to it, and so I can kind of get that with you know b being lonely. Now I guess I I'm not alone. Like I live with my family and stuff, but sometimes you wish you had that companionship, mm -hmm. you know. And it's just like you get you're just like oh this is my life. I guess I'm just kind of used to it. But you always have that feeling like you want something more in your life. So, and being a breakup song, this actually uh, reminded me of a bit that. Um, the piece of human garbage formerly known as Louis C.K. Um, joked about in one of his routines that um, no good marriage ever ended up in divorce. Yeah. Like, divorce should be celebrated. And I guess the same with the breakup. It's a bad relationship has come to an end. Right. Good relationships don't come apart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, it's like a point of self-reflection. Is the thing that you miss... Not necessarily the other person, but it's what they represented. Right. Filling a space that you once had. If you feel someone completes you, then you're missing something. Wow. That hurt. That hurt to hear. <laughs> <laughs> so our next track is Connecticut. It's one of my top three favorite songs on this album. Um, so I lived it. in Connecticut. It's one of the three states I yes, lived in. Yes, that's true. Mm. Um. So I was about to say, let's give this a spin, but no, let's talk to Nolan and Jake. And then we'll give it a spin. And then we'll muse. Our next track on here is Connecticut. Um, and this is where I said Paramore, because for some reason there's like a misery business vibe I got. Okay. You know what? Yeah. Okay, Aaron. Okay. I could, I could see it. I could see it. Yeah. I, and I can't pinpoint where it was. I just remember listening to it and being like, huh. Yeah. As long, okay. Okay. But riddle me this, Aaron. What album? <laughs> what album? What oh, album, Paramore? Oh, I'm not a Paramore fan. I just know that one song. Oh, okay, fine. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> so Riot. All right, that's fine. Yeah. Or to be <laughs> fair, I know I know like two or three Paramore songs because they played them at work all the time. But this I'm, one, I was like, I was like, what song is this? I know it. I've heard it before. Oh, it's this <laughs> one. Like that's what's what it was. <laughs> and and that's not to say you stole it. What I'm saying is that they're like it's familiar in a good way. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I like yeah, to yeah. always compare that. Um, and there was, don't get offended what I'm also about to say. I also <laughs> feel like there was this, <laughs> this, these are all good things, I promise. There was a point um, where like it really gets stripped down, I think vocally, and it sounded a lot like new Machine Gun Kelly, which is really Ooh. weird. I know. I, take that, I take that a good listened, way. I have not listened to any new Machine Gun Kelly. Or, Nor have I. Or old Machine Gun Kelly. Yeah. I, Nor have I. I, 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 do I I've never listened to, to him. I have I've never I've, listened to him before. But like the new song, yeah, I just have no context for it. I'm gonna look that up later and be like, "Man, fuck you, Aaron." 
<laughs> he did he did this really good genre shift and um it's it's definitely it's definitely more him i think um but there was mm. just one point like the the way that the vocals sounded i think followed a similar melody vein and um and i was like hey that's machine gun kelly so yeah. hey like you're mgk now um but there was so. a line in here in particular uh you slip out like smoke of my car window i think i don't might have even worded that wrong but um that's Monday. again um it is right okay i cut and paste a lot of this but i'm not sure um that was perfect imagery like I, that's what I, I always like to pull out really good Im imagery lines because they um they that's that's just always good relation for a lot of people especially me so yeah you slip out like the smoke of my car window uh, i picture that immediately i actually picture like a ghost like casper just like floating out a window mm -hmm. uh, yeah uh, dude, jake is so fucking good at that it actually <laughs> yeah. be angry like i'm actually <laughs> i actually don't like jake <laughs> <laughs> because of it. he's always he always like he'll send me some shit that he's working on i'm just like oh for fuck's sake dude you're a fucking asshole <laughs> like, I, I i try to be smart like that but i i just don't have that level of intelligence that can work things that way literally you know? all my lyrics that i ever write i very have to go through jake first for that reason it's like i need someone way more smarter and in touch with words <laughs> <laughs> so this was one of my my two top favorite tracks on this album and so I really want to hear a lot about that. You know, I, I always love the songs that talk about places that I know about. So I get excited. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, Connecticut, Rhode Island. I've been there. So Yeah. Um, well, well, the whole the whole structure of this song kind of uh, predicates on the, the very common uh, experience of being stuck in Connecticut's highway, like the two-lane highway. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it's called. 95. Not 95, I'm talking about the two lane highway. Oh, Merrick Parkway. Merrick Parkway, getting stuck there in traffic for like hours and hours and hours. But while I went, while we went on our first tour, which is like when, what this was written about, um, I was, that's when the big kind of breakup that I was dealing with that I wrote about happened. Um, like it was while we were on tour. Um, and so I wrote the song when we got home. Well, after we actually ended up breaking up, like the day after, um, just about being stuck in traffic and not being able to do anything but sit there in traffic while you know your relationship's falling apart and you're from different, you're just in different places. Um, oh I mean, gosh. no one can kind of speak to uh, the general emotional <laughs> turmoil. <laughs> I, I never occurred. wanted to get Jake home from a tour so bad. I was just like, we, I need to get this person home. <laughs> <laughs> it was, you know, not it was, be on tour as of right now. Yeah. <laughs> done. Like, I mean, it was a great time, but I was just, you know, was. I was going yeah. through it. Um, so like, I thought it'd be really just right to kind of like frame an entire song around being stuck in traffic in Connecticut because that was one of the worst parts of the whole experience for me. Mm. Um, and waking up, waking up in like, like on air mattresses and remembering what was happening in my life. Oh, you know what I mean? Because yeah. I'd wake up and be like, oh, I'm a tour. And then it'd be like, oh, my relationship's falling apart. And it would be mm. like, oh, that realization every day that I'm just yeah, like. The, the night before that drive, we ended up playing in Connecticut with the band called, uh, we were on tour with Familiar Spaces and we played with, uh, back. yeah, oh my God. And we played with uh, a band called Plans from uh, Indiana. Mm -hmm. And um, and we all, all three band, ah, actually, I don't know if Fam ended up staying. I think Corey did, but um, we all ended up staying in an old college friends of mine's house, like right near the venue. Mm -hmm. I mean, it ended up being like a total party. Like we just, you know, drinking, you know, hanging out all night and stuff like rager. a little oh, okay <laughs> like, it kind of did in my eyes it did i'd never been to college parties I was there, like, was, there was like 10 of us <laughs> 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 rager um but but yeah so we all like got pretty intoxicated the night before and then just like i just remember all of us waking up feeling like that was fucking dumb and then like plus poor jacob like dealing with mm. all that like yeah, yeah this, it was a it was a day, man. That was a day. <laughs> yeah. Good real highs, real lows. I wake up in Connecticut, the lines of a bad smile tattoo on my cheeks, above my lips, around my eyes. I can taste morning in my teeth, can see the usual lack of sleep. I fall victim to the
And now, time to pay our bills. Hey, Aaron, have you heard about Anchor? No, I haven't. It's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. Is it free? As a matter of fact, it is free. It costs you no money. It comes with creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast. Get this, right from your phone or computer. You know, I've been looking for a place that I could distribute my podcast so it could be heard on like Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Is that something that Anchor does? Well, baby, you found it. Anchor does do that. Even better, you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. You know, to me, it sounds like it's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. It is indeed. If you're listening and you've ever wanted to make a podcast, you should download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm and get started. I'll get right on that. We did. Esotericofthepodcast.com. All right, I'm kind of annoyed here. Why is that? TBA. Uh, like I'm really identifying with this album. <laughs> like these songs are getting me. I, I don't know. That's, I, I was hoping that would happen because I I listened to this record and I I admit I when the album came out I kind of brushed it off because I was just like oh, it's you know people I used to play music with. I was kind of you know against the scene for a hot minute because of you know stuff I went through at the end of being in the band. But listening to this record again, I was like good again for the first time. Um, I was like I am ashamed that I pushed it off for so long because this was worth the listen. Yeah, yeah, this you is know? good stuff. Um, it's just that line that you slip out like smoke I'm out my car window. Just going to say it. that, yeah. I can't tell you how many cigarettes I smoked while driving simply to watch the smoke <laughs> going out the window. You, you want to hear a disgusting anecdote? But uh, when I was about 11 years old, um, my dad and I did some glamping with the family because it's not camping. We were in a camper. We were moving the camper, and he had his friend helping him. He was in the passenger seat. And his friend decided to roll down the window in the moving car and hock a loogie. And I thought it was the coolest thing to watch it fly by the car. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Random thought sweet. there. But, um, yeah, isn't that such a good visual? You know, you slip out like smoke out my car window. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's just like it just fades away and becomes nothing. And that's how people can sometimes be in your life. Mm. And uh, I'm taking it from the lyrics, too, that... Uh from a religious family? Yeah, so uh, we talk about it in the interview a little more, but um, yeah, they both come, I don't know if both of them, uh, Jake definitely comes from a more religious family and, you know, is having, he doesn't really identify with the religious, you know, aspect of that, yeah. you know, uh, anymore. Is there a, well, hopefully you guys will be listening to our episode. Mm -hmm. So uh, I get a word of advice to Jake because uh, I'm a PK myself. I'm like Preach's kid I'm for us 20 year olds that don't know that. Yeah. Uh, so I grew up in a very religious household. And um, so there's a line that kind of stuck out to me. I don't think I'm a prayer or a kneeler. And even if I were, I'm sure he's not too keen on taking calls from me either. So listen, that's not the way God works. Um, God doesn't intervene directly. But if you're walking around with carpal tunnel syndrome because you're pressing your arms too tight when you're watching TV or you're grinding your teeth at night, that's God listening to you and telling you, mm -hmm. dude, you're doing it wrong. That's how he intervenes. So just keep that in mind. That that was that was deep, man. In well, my moments. We're we're gonna <laughs> discover more of that religious theme in um Litviticus 420 and Cigarette Etiquette, but we'll save it till we get there. Yeah, noticing the, the song title, so it's definitely, you know, it's, yeah, it doesn't it, take much to pick up on a theme. It's not great. Yeah, and, and I love the entirety of this record, but I will say track 7 to 11 is my favorite part of the album. The second half is, I think, the, the best half. Um, but I do enjoy elements of every part of this record at any point in time. And, you know, if you haven't listened to it, stop what you're doing and listen to it. But, yeah, right. Seriously. Um, because I kind of stopped it short, let's listen to And the Drive Home. <laughs> Following that is And the Drive Home, and that song, like, the vibe of it just completely makes sense for a drive home. Like, it's this, like, you know, you think about, like, if you're, like, if you're fighting with somebody, for example, and you have to drive home with them, you know, or even <laughs> the self-reflection of, like, your life driving home, like, that entire vibe is, like, exactly how that feels. You know, the guitar tone, um, the room sound, everything. 
Yeah, it was mm. it was super cinema. It's still cinematic to me hearing mm. that song. You know, um, it feels like it should be in something. There should be a visual there, yeah. but there doesn't need to be. Um, Jake um, took that song a co- not very many times in studio. There was only a couple takes, and that that was one of those songs where like Jake took it and me and Ian were at, so it was just you know one mic, vocal booth, acoustic guitar, mm. um, and me and Ian, uh, our producer, were just sitting outside of that booth. And um, as soon as the take concluded, we were like, that's done, done, that's it. Like, don't eat, don't touch it, don't don't really do much to yeah, it. And, and I disagreed, I fought that. I didn't yeah. think that was the one at all. <laughs> we're like, fuck well, you, Jake. <laughs> and, and one thing I particularly love about the song is like there is are distinct points where there are like probably not great notes that go with the key played, but they add to the atmosphere of the song. I love it. You know, and I don't yeah. know if those were intentional or not, but they were. It's- it's easier to like it now, I think, and for its imperfections than I did. Because, like, technically we recorded it in 2018. So there was a bit of time between when we uh, recorded it and when we actually put it out. So by the time we put it out, I was like, I love all these imperfections. I think it's cool. <laughs> but, <laughs> but at first I was like, man, what did we, did we drop the ball? Should we have done another take? Like, I was concerned a little bit. But mm. I, I think it's cool for what it is. If it were somebody else's voice just doing it in that style, I'd be like, I love how raw it is, but because it's mine, I'm like all weird about it. Yeah, I totally understand that. Um, yeah, I, I, I just put out a record uh, a couple months ago, and uh, when I put out the record, I, th- there's a song where I intended for it to be raw, and I'm like, it sounds like shit. I, don't like <laughs> I do that when my vocals aren't raw. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're, well, you're brutal on yourself and your vocals. No, not in a cool way, not like cool brutal. <laughs> <Not real. laughs> Just a little snug around your way I can see the strain of loving me In each detail of your all right, so I'm going to do a little projection here, okay? Which is a term in psychology when you, um, you know, project your problems or thoughts onto someone or something else. Um, I spent a short period of time living in Connecticut while I was dating somebody back here, and you know, going back and forth every other weekend. So this seems like a continuation from the last song. Yeah, well, uh, you actually haven't heard the interview, so there is a whole story to this. The the spark notes here is that they were on tour and he was going through a, Jake was going through a breakup while they had just started on tour. So the last one, I think they were like staying at somebody's house and he waking up on a deflated mattress, realizing, hey, this stuff's still going on. And, and this is I don't know if this is necessarily the drive home. It might be. But still, yeah, you know, it's that, yeah. you know, you wake up the next day and it still didn't go away, even though you got a, a sleep out of it. Well, the song's called in a drive home. Right. <laughs> I know. I uh <laughs> I don't um, know. I could feel you outgrowing me. Yeah, there's just um Well that line's a call back to Connecticut. They say that. Yeah. I totally um and this is one of the things that I like about both poetry and music and writing is sometimes it touches you in a way that you you're brought back to a state of mind that you were yep. in. Like and I'm thinking, obviously, this is being written from a bad place. Mm-hmm. Um, and it makes me remember being in bad places, but not in a bad way. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense to me. Like, I can, I think at a point in your life where you're content, you can be nostalgic for when you were miserable. Right. And I'm kind of getting that right now. Well, I'm happy to say, and again, I love all parts of this album, but this next few tracks are my favorite tracks on this album. Um, in order, you know, not of any order of hierarchy, but just like they just get progressively better. Um, So I really want to dive right into adhesive. Um, This is something that I resonated with a lot when I listened to it. And I think I mentioned that in the interview. So let's talk, go to the interview first, and then we'll listen to it. (laughs) So my second, well, I, 
this there's no two order like these these two are like my top favorite but adhesive is also my favorite song on this record um and I, I, you're right about that let me slip that one in mine sorry go on <laughs> um Changing I, your answer. Cut, I cut and pasted an entire lot like section of words in because um i listened to that and i'm like whoa okay yeah that's like been my life the past few years and it's uh why should i hold this together why am i the one apologizing to you i'm forever your adhesive use me at your convenience and i'm like what i what i loved is i was listening to the song and i get towards the end and i'm like adhesive like what the hell like is it like are you like the glue like keeping like I was, I was trying to figure it out because it was it almost seemed like you know it was positive like i'm your adhesive use me at your convenience and i actually had to go back and i'm like i missed this whole section I had to go back and give it a second listen. I'm like, oh, this is exactly what I think it is. You're the adhesive. You're actually keeping something together, you know, mm -hmm. even though that's probably shouldn't be the case. And that's been my life for so long. So I listened to that. And I was like, whoa, other people feel that way? Yeah. I mean, everyone's got, like, everyone has had an experience with, like, a friend who is just only about their own shit. Like, they don't mm -hmm. see anything apart from their own shit. Um you know, like, and that doesn't necessarily even mean that they're bad people. It's just that they like they're they're toxic to be around. Like it's hard, like it's painful to stay um, close with a person who pushes you away. If someone um, has to like have a sort of ego death. You know what I'm saying? That mm, can be really hard. If someone's yeah. yet to like see hurt that they cause, at least just see it. Just see it. Like you can't mm. change it. See it, and yeah, and change moving forward. You know. Yeah just kind of the idea of like you're gonna you're gonna blow up at me or you're gonna say something shitty i'm gonna take it and i'm gonna not say what i should say or set the boundaries that i need to set and i'm just gonna take it and continue to hold our relationship together via my own suffering like mm. and it's a, i think it's a place that a lot of people fall into with people because they do care about people and they've got memories with people um and the song is just about the frustration of that, you know, someone who will just like, you know, say the worst things in an argument and then like try to turn it around on you, right. you know, just yeah, that kind of shit. Yeah. Um, and I'm glad that like we were able to make a song that feels so like, you know, big giant middle fingers up to that as a concept i think right like i like i because people have said like oh like i love this because like i super relate to it um which is just you know really dope it's the coolest thing ever to hear all the time any single yeah. every single time it happens and, um and especially just because like i did write a lot of the lyrics of that song in such angry like fucking furies you know mm. like just like spitting as i do it because i'm just pissed <laughs> off like yeah. it's just it's, it's good it's cool to know that like people hear that and they're like oh yeah man fuck that guy whoever that guy is <laughs> fuck him angry Every angry jake is one of my favorite jakes just because it's always just so on point you know it's always yeah. so on point every time jake <laughs> says something with anger i'm always like you know what yeah <laughs> like <laughs> I'm like, I'm with that guy. <laughs> yeah. Every and what I love is like everybody's got that person. You know, everyone's got that person where it's like, why am I wasting my time? Like, screw you, you know? <laughs> um, and I and the thing that I actually related to was um I, I, I'm very involved in scouts and there's a one unit in particular that was falling apart, and I was really the glue that was holding that together. So in a lot of ways it wasn't just one relationship, it was my relationship with everybody in that unit. And so mm. I like I and I took a different look at it for that reason. So um, that's cool yeah um I like that. It, adhesive you know just i love i love that it's not glue. don't be the adhesive, adhesive yeah. you know maybe yeah. in your maybe in your family if it's not horrifically toxic and abusive but like yeah otherwise don't be the adhesive <laughs> and also maybe not even in your family if that gets to be too much for well, that's what i well that's what i said <laughs> listen I'm gonna I'm coming, drive I'm to your Providence. house. I'm driving my ass to Providence. I'm gonna You're drive getting, your ass to Providence. You're getting a swirly. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm I'm just picturing that, and I'm gonna move on now. Um. <laughs>
So I find that um, really relatable to a prior relationship of mine mm-hmm. where, you know, you feel like you're the, the glue holding together a lot of it. Um, but it's really hard to do that when that person is consistently one screw loose. Um, but yeah, I'm forever your adhesive. Use me at your convenience. Like you almost want to be the um, the person to help and, and, and put you back together. But it's actually detrimental to yourself. You know, why should I hold this together? Why am I the one apologizing to you? Ooh, you know? Yeah. yeah, you shouldn't be. No. No. And my favorite part of the song is um, that part where they do like that, that, um, that scoop and pitch at adhesive. Forever your adhesive. Um, this is my favorite part of the song. Hmm. And there's this thing, but uh, give a rest to the teeth. You squeeze your daily lives between. I'm picking up on some TMJ here. T- I'm yeah. just going to go with that theme. Like I, <laughs> I, I, I want to know: Did this uh, girl have TMJ? Because that seems <laughs> it's a very specific thing. Yeah. Uh, what is that? What what does TMJ stand for? It's a tr- tempo mandibular jaw um, disorder. So um, tempo, temporal is being that part of your skull. A man, mandible yes, is your jaw. jaw yeah. And then jaw, the jaw disorder. That's like saying ATM machine disorder. It I is. Guess, <laughs> well, ATM machine disorder <laughs> means you give out too much money to people. Yes, your jaw consists of the temporal mandibular. Um, <laughs> your jaw consists of the head jaw. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, so... I want on this next song, it's called Litvitigus 420, Litvitigus 420, which is obviously a play on words to Leviticus, right? And 420. Um, anyway, um, keep an eye out here for this like hymn kind of sound, like mm-hmm. in the um, the instrumentation. And from what I understand from talking to them, like that sort of thing was unintentional, but it happened. So keep an eye out for it. Like keep an ear out for it, I should say. Um, but first, let's talk to them and have them mention exactly that. So the next track, I don't want to just misconstrue this message because I think I understand it, but it probably sounds better coming from you guys. And um, it, it, am I pronouncing this right? Litviticus 420? Yes, that yes, that's okay. correct. <laughs> All right. Because it's underlined uh, red, and I'm like, this has got to be like it, intentionally wrong. It's underlined red because it's blasphemous. <laughs> Perfect. To say, technically, probably. Perfect. It's it's like it's like playfully heretical, um, yeah. Um, Leviticus four twenty silly title aside is about um, kind of the rise of or not necessarily not even necessarily the rise the existence and uh, permanence of like evangelical like white supremacy in America, mm. um, and the ways in which many leaders and powerful people in our country use Christianity and be evangelical Christianity specifically um, to kind of like mask, you know, a lot of bigotry and a lot of even just like underhandedness, like, you know, teething, like taking money from people who are, you know, a little like vulnerable and less educated. Like there's a lot of, there are a lot of people proclaiming the name of Christ in a very shitty way, which is like, so I, I grew up in a very religious household. Um, so like, I, I really ended up rejecting the life that I was kind of raised to believe in. But um, I carried the knowledge of like what the Bible actually holds with me because we had to read it a lot. That was just the kind of church it was. Um, and so like, I know Jesus is like, honestly, like a socialist person of color who was like murdered for speaking truth to power. And like, these people who proclaim Christianity in America, you know, they, they haven't read the damn thing. They don't fucking know what they're talking about because right. the way they use Christianity to like just do evil, it, it's horrendous. And the song kind of plays out as like this, you know, faux worship song. Like it, it comes in and it's like, it's kind of playful, but like in a weird, not playful way. But I kind of wanted to kind of like evoke that feel of like a worship song and then just rip it apart at the end. Cause it's even, like, the, even the chord progression that you wrote for it, like the two, uh, two, five, uh, one, one minor seven, um, yeah. like kind of chord progression that, that it follows before like the, the ending, mm-hmm. uh, is, is so like reminiscent of like, like, uh, uh, chords that like a church organist would play that, that dawned mm-hmm. on me like recently, like after the fact, <laughs> I always wondered why it, why it like the, like why that song 
uh, drove the point home so hard. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Even before it started to really kick in. And it was because that, um, that chord progression is just super Christian hymn vibes. It took like one of my students um, at the, I teach music lessons um, full time. And um, one of my students um, only, only plays um, Christian hymns. Um, mm -hmm. All he's interested in playing, it's all his parents are interested in having him play. Um, so that's fine. That's what we do. Um, and, um, and he was playing one day and it just like, it just hit me. I was like, dude, Leviticus is a worship song. Like it, it straight up is, but go on. Sorry. No, that's, that's, that's all pretty much. Well, well there was a point and I actually had to go onto your band camp and pull up the lyrics to find it. But like, I think literally that, uh, praises be to our beloved Jesus. Like, or maybe it's the, the lines that come before that. Like there was a point where I listened to that. I'm like, that is exactly what church sounds like. That is it right there. And I, I just put my finger on it. I'm like, I've heard this every Sunday for like every day of my life. Um, and um, where was I going to um, – it, it's it's really unfortunate how pe much people have weaponized Christianity. You know, like my last name is legitimately Christian, and I'm offended. Um, but uh, <laughs> um, but I, I try to live my life by this code. Kind of, I, I'm a big Star Wars fan. I try to live my life kind of like by Jediism, where it just it's all boiled. All the world's religions boiled down into one thing. Let's just don't be a dick. So at the end of the day, just be a Jedi. Don't be a dick. Facts. Um, it felt it felt really good to have a, a song where we talked about this too. Like yeah. I kind of knew like I wasn't gonna be the one to write this because um, hmm. I didn't grow up in a Christian household, like by any means really. Um, but I, my mother is Jewish, my dad is Catholic and they couldn't really, uh, they, the families kind of fought uh, when I was born, like what are we gonna indoctrinate him into? And it ended up being nothing because of that fighting for which I never right. gave him full. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, growing up um, in my little nook of Southeast Massachusetts where everyone was like, uh, catholic or some form of christian some form of christian yeah like uh unfortunately it got out in like middle school that my mom was jewish and i got death threats at, at 10 years old T oh 10 and 11 year old kids were saying like we're gonna come to your house and kill you and your your jew bagel mother oh i like th these were things that were said to me when i was you know like like i had i had a friend one time too someone i considered a friend be like have you been saved uh, while we were in class. And I was like, I don't know what that means. Cause quite literally, I did not know what it means. She's like, have you been baptized? I was like, no, I don't think I have. I don't, I don't really do the religion thing. I was never told to. Um, and she straight up looked at me. She's like, I'm terrified for you. You're going to burn in hell. Like in class. And I was like, whoa, what? Like, this is too much. So like, and that, um, that uh, carried on throughout, throughout high school. Um, and stuff like that. So I just like, yeah, growing up as someone who just like straight up wasn't, it's not even that I'm not Christian. I'm not really anything. Um, and, and it just, you know, it made me a target and it, it felt really good to finally like be involved in a song that highlighted some of the, the, the hostility behind, yeah. um, mm. behind that. It's a running theme that I, I channel a lot of Nolan's rage into what I write so that he can feel it when we play the songs. <laughs> like, I literally take things from his life. I'll, like, write things that only apply to him. Like, I don't smoke cigarettes, or I never did. Um, I and, like, so that way he's like, yeah, yeah, I know. Like, this is me, too. <laughs> like, you know, because we're both singing it. <laughs> and I don't want to I don't want to drag this out too far, but, um, you know, like, I feel like, especially in this area, because a lot of people are Catholic in this area, and the rest mm. of the United States is Protestant, like I stopped being a Catholic because I really didn't like the idea of like I had to go through other people to have this relationship with a higher power. And that's mm -hmm. not something like that doesn't make sense to me. Why can't I just do it on my own? And, and yeah. you know, so it's having that, you know, being saved or things like that. Why? Why can't I just have that relationship? Yeah, um, spirit, there's and, nothing wrong with spiritualism being a private thing. Like Exactly. Hey, I heard you are forgiven, squeaky clean. Okay, 
I have thoughts. Okay. I want to hear them. So here's the thing. None of that is what Jesus is about. I think that's the point. I hope so. Be- well, so, so think about it, right? I think the the message more here is is the unfortunate weaponizing of religion. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think that's what the the joke is. But yes, I agree with you. Yeah. I uh, but I get concerned. I get I get frightened when people are turned off of our Lord and Savior because of the shit that people say and do in His name. Like all Jesus was saying was question authority, have an intimate personal relationship with God. And that's actually something we talked about in the interview, you know, how important it is. That's why I stopped being Catholic. I say this in the interview, but that's why I stopped being Catholic, because I don't want to have to go through anybody else to have that personal, intimate discussion. Yeah. You know, I think it's more important for me to come up with that connection on my own. And why there are parents and there are people in this world that think it's important to forge that connection for you is, I think, I don't know why they think that's the thing. I think it's super inappropriate and unfortunate. Mm-hmm. I think that you should be given the tools to find your own beliefs. You know? I concur. It, it's kind of, I mean, I guess it, at one point it's sort of like in music where you need to learn the rules in order to break them. Yes. So you, you need the basis. You need to understand. You need to know who this dude was and what his story was. But, yeah, I, um, you know, I grew up in the church. That was my whole life. My most intimate relationship with with God and Jesus, I guess I, I got there on my own yeah. out, outside of, uh, but don't give up on the guy. He's cool. It's everything around him sucks. It's yeah. It's, um, it's the nonchalant approach. I think a lot of people take to religion. That is what turned me off to, because it's an intensely personal and, and sometimes scary thing to think about because it is what dictates who you are and what dictates your demise necessarily where you think that what's going to happen after the fact. So it's all about making the right choices now because you don't necessarily know. You just got to believe it. It's yeah. kind of like Santa Claus. Seeing isn't, always, you know, isn't always believing. Right. That's what a leap um, of faith is. Well, and this is why when, when I one of the notes I wrote down for years, I didn't want to misconstrue the message because this is a complex thing, mm. you know. And if if the, who, whichever person ended up writing the song, and I'm, I'm not totally clear, and I don't want to, you know, say this specifically, but if if they're feeling that they've fallen out of you know faith on something for a particular reason, like I'm, I'm sure it's well founded, but. You know, and I'm sure they've done a lot of thinking on that topic, you know. Yeah. Sometimes I just feel like even if it doesn't make sense, and I think a lot of times in this record we talk about this, they talk about this, I should say, where, you know, they kneel when they didn't expect to kneel and pray when they didn't expect to pray. Like sometimes when you when you have nothing else, just having a little bit of faith is what you need. Yeah. I always felt like, you know, people will say sometimes, I, I've heard that expression, like God moves in mysterious ways. Yeah. <laughs> I really don't think he does. Anytime I've asked God for something, I've received it. Mm-hmm. I may have rude asking for it more than once. I have rude asking for it, um, but I feel like somebody's listening. Yeah. So, so our next track, Cigarette. I feel like yeah, you will like that title, Cigarette Kit. Um, really enjoy this track. Um, and I'm going to let them talk about it. So cigarette kit. Um, we, t- we talked about when we talked to Cleo Patrick, um, we talked about one of their songs where they talked about, you know, the boys that wear the, the backward baseball caps and they're just like those assholes. Um, mm-hmm. and we, we tried to ask ourselves, like, has there ever been a point like where there's like a, a song that's actually promoting those types of people? The reason why I bring that up is because there's always those assholes in high school that never grew up and just got older. You know, everybody knows at least one person that still acts that way. Um, yeah. And that, I think, is the glue, the adhesive that pulls this entire song together. Call back. Um, and I know there's more to this song, so I want to let you talk about that. But I, I thought that was really important to note. Hmm. Sorry. Well, I'm so sorry. Can you say just like the last part of that again? Because I feel like I missed it. Sure. Oh, I was just saying that, um, um, you know, I, I relate to that, that, you know, never grew up and just got older. And I know there's more to the song than just that line. So I oh, want yeah. to expand a little more. Oh, yeah. OK. Um, I mean, it's kind of like a dual. It, it sounds like one experience, but it ki- I kind of wrote it as two separate experiences. 
um, the first verse being mine and the second one being Nolan's. Um, just because we, we, you know, Nolan went to college, Nolan went to high school parties, like Nolan kind of like lived that life. I was very um, introverted and didn't get really invited to things. I didn't experience like partying any certain way. So when I write something about a party, I'm like, I'm like, all right, what am I, what am I really writing here? What am I doing? Um, but but the, so the whole idea was just the feeling of like, you know, I had, fr- I had freshly moved to Providence. Nolan, you know, um, was living at home or whatever after he had left school or whatever. Um, and just this idea of like, wow, every time I'm in this space with these people, and it's been like two years now, you know, they're the same people. Like we talk and, you know, they're not, they're not aspiring for anything. They're not trying anything new. Like they're only interested in like just what they know and what they've always known. And I, I don't know if it's like, necessarily a bad thing but it can be you know um especially with a lot of people who grow up in these like very um you know, these neighborhoods where everyone's the same you know not very diverse suburbs typically you know um where you know people can just they don't get exposed to other kinds of people and they just like literally carry uh you know just super outdated and shitty bigoted beliefs and i mean so the song was just kind of about being in that space and just being like what the fuck am i doing here like you know like maybe like signifying the last of those events you really ever go to just feeling like you know this isn't for me anymore i've clearly outgrown this but just that feeling of kind of bitter angriness that you do at those people and also sadness a little bit um yeah it's just it's it's kind of like a fuck the hometown heroes song i guess didn't you didn't you go to that party at Ronnie's house that I couldn't make for some reason. I did. It was terrible. Yeah, I feel like that. I feel like a lot of the inspiration for this song came from. That. It did. Yeah, you're right. You know what? Now that you mention it, yeah, yeah <laughs> a lot yeah. of it did. Like, I was... my, my like high school ex girlfriend was there, and like a bunch of douchebags. And she was kin- your high school ex girlfriend's friend was trying to convince me that you were a terrible person. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. She yeah, was, yeah. but she was so drunk, and, and it was she, like. like it was unfortunate because she was really trying to make points, but she could barely form sentences. And I was like, you just got to stop spitting. She, she had it out for me for some reason. She thought I wasn't like good enough for her friend. Um, you know, that typical, I don't no, know. I, I, oh, I remember. <laughs> but, but like this person thought I was like the worst guy on the earth. This person is like now an avid like Trump backer, like back to blue, like, like isolated their trans sibling, like doesn't talk to them. Mm. um they're like like i know for a fact that this person who was trying to like i don't know just disown me is like admittedly a cruel cold she was mean she was was a mean person like yeah but yeah it was it was definitely based on that party because i remember like trying to visualize it and it was always this house like by the woods a big house by the woods and that's exactly it (laughs) yeah our our old drummer kind of like after leaving the band um just went to the wayside he just became like oh like just that backwoods like we shouldn't stuff. talk about it we shouldn't talk about it he's a real person living his life i don't get no one's gonna fucking he's not gonna catch work. i know, <laughs> I, know. Fuck him, dude. I don't care who's, i who's agree yeah like, I you actually like the Confederate flag he can go fuck himself like yo i 100 percent agree but let's just not with them yeah, so that's cigarette kit. <laughs> yeah. well, the cigarette in rib cages, because cigarette right? is my hometown being fucking shit. <laughs> yeah, some good stuff. Actually, you know what? Before we stop talking about cigarette kit, I do want to talk a little bit. Just want to point out um, that we had like a really good experience in the studio, and that with cigarette kit, like um, that whole like middle part uh, where it gets softer and all that. Mm-hmm. So much of why that sounds, how it sounds, is because of Ian Joshua Riley, and I just want to point that out. Um, <laughs> he's he was our producer, and he's amazing, and I just wanted to point that out. Like the double guitar solo, like we didn't know what we were gonna do, um, and we figured it out like in real time, just in that moment, and it was a very cool That's experience. Awesome. It was very exciting for us. Shout out to stay here, uh, Carter Harden and Haley Mewborn for the group vocals. Oh yeah, true.
want to mention this is the reason why I got a cold brew today. I was wondering that. Yeah, yeah, yeah this is exactly why. Well, it kind of put the thought in my head. I'm like, oh, yeah, cold brew is a thing. So did you guys discuss at all exactly what cigarette cigarette um, Jesus. Like the term cigarette etiquette? What they consider cigarette etiquette to be, because there definitely is an etiquette to smoking cigarettes. I can't remember, to be okay. honest with you. Um, I The thing I remember talking about this song, I, I haven't reviewed the interview up to this. It's an hour long interview. And, you know, but um, the thing I remember talking about this is that this is a, I believe it was a party with a bunch of people they went to high school with. Pretty straightforward. Yeah. You know, and you just around those like same people that never grew up. They just got a little bit older, but they're still the same pieces of yep. crap. Um, I mean, it's pretty self explanatory what it talks about. I think there was uh, an ex girlfriend of Nolan um, was there as well. You know, they talk about it more in the thing. I'm trying to explain it for you right yeah. now, but well, you know, I, <laughs> I've had conversations with Burgess and bigots with shit. Cigarette. As a smoker, as somebody yeah. who smoked for 20 years, um, and smoked at parties and stuff like there's a certain etiquette you should follow as a smoker and certain things that you should do or it shouldn't do to be socially acceptable. Yeah. And so many people violate that. It's like Larry David and his unwritten rules. I have so many unwritten rules that I get mad at people for not following. But that's me. Um, OK, I could go on a rant about the things that other smokers did when I was a smoker that really bothered me. Hmm. Because it's a, became a socially unacceptable thing to do. Yeah. So you should not be an asshole. Yeah. Well, and you're right. Yeah. There's definitely an etiquette about smoking. I mean, think about just like having a cigarette in public at all. You know, if you're around anyone that's a non smoker, like there's just an etiquette of like, you know, maybe not blowing it in places that, you know, yeah. well, it's like if, disruptive. I was, if I was still a smoker, we're, we're recording this episode in my house and we're hanging out in my space. And if I wanted to smoke, I would smoke. But I'm not going to blow it in your fucking face. Yeah. Like, that's just being a dick. Right. I would go to lengths to try to be um, not a dick about it. Mm -hmm. But so many people who are... You could classify it's the kind of person who smokes, but I take objection to that. I seriously could go on a rant for hours about smoking. I won't. We won't do that. No, we won't. <laughs> uh. If anybody wants to hear I've been... that, esoteric of the podcast at gmail.com. Yeah, email me. I'll be happy to talk to you about <laughs> cigarette kit. Um, so, our next track that we are going to talk to Nolan and Jake about is In Rib Cages. Both of them have said that this is one of their favorite songs on the record, with, you know, um, a few stuck in in between, but they both really enjoyed this song. Cool, cool. Um, so, In Rib Cages. In Rib, in rib Cages. Um, I loved the area specific imagery um, because it, I think it just describes a lot in this song, like what it's like to just live and grow up here, you know, in a lot of ways. And I, I, I love songs that talk about places I know about. That's, that's really what I'm getting at. Um, yeah. But mm -hmm. um, again, uh, in rib cages, I know this is like one of you guys's, or I don't like, it was both of you guys's one of your favorite songs. So yeah, I love it. That. I really do love it. It's like, I really do think it's, one of if not the best song we have as as a band so far um just because i think it really tells a story and it really like paints a mood um and a feeling um uh, i mean like kind of like the, it's just like weird like it's not even it's funny because it's like not even really about any one thing it's just kind of like feelings thinking about how you've grown and thinking about how people are and um you know, it was just kind of a song about my feelings and nothing else. Um, but I just think it like resonates. And I think, like I said, I think it's a song that I would have listened to at 15 and like cried to, I feel like. And that's mm. kind of like what I want to write for myself, I guess. Right. But yeah. yeah Nolan, why is it your favorite? Sorry. No, no, go <laughs> ahead. I'd, I'd rather hear from Nolan than hear anything I have to say. I. <laughs> I suppose, um, yeah, it's just got that penultimate feel as far as where it is in the the album and the sort of like the swing time vibe of it. Like, I've just always wanted to write a song that has that that sort of feel, that sort yeah. of 
Nolan wrote the original instrumental for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's uh, I posted a, a video to Instagram like when I wrote the riff like years ago, and it's still on there. Um, and I sometimes I will scroll down to my Instagram and like listen to. I like what it became. You know, it started as like a forty-five second guitar clip where I wrote like up to the second verse. Um, uh, just on guitar, just the riff, and it's it's cool to listen back and then listen to what it became, mm. and and just the memories I have, like Jake said, of it of it coming alive in the studio. Um, wow, Jake, nice asshole. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so um, sorry. <laughs> maybe put it on vibrate next time, prick. <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> this is a family show no it's yeah not, i was worry. fucking talking um, <laughs> um excuse me yeah no um it uh it's just cool to listen to what it became i don't mm. know it's a good it's a good vibe it gives me mayday parade vibes yeah um, definitely does probably why i like it yeah oh and there's a, a major callback in it too that i is just i'm really happy about it i'm yeah, I'm just kind of flexing right now, I guess. I'm just saying something that I wrote is cool, but. <laughs> what it is. Uh, I'm starting, the lyric, I'm starting to think we're all ex-friends and former lovers uh, recovering from one another mm. and fucking up is just inevitable. That is supposed to be like a direct call back to recover and yeah. the way I felt when I was a lot younger about breakups and stuff. And I, I just thought that was an, a neat little way to show growth, mm. even if it's like, subtle and not like pronounced really. Solution to finding world peace. Wow. Okay. We just we we're there now. Right. That's how I, yeah. I got there. So you know when you're listening to somebody and you're thinking about how vacant they are and their problems are petty and stupid. To them, everybody else's problems are petty and stupid. Every person that is experiencing a problem is the biggest thing in the world, yeah. and we need to acknowledge that and get past it in order to communicate. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. You know what line hits me in the feels here? Mm -hmm. I'm starting to think we're all ex-friends and former lovers recovering from one another and fucking up is just inevitable. Okay. I have had a small amount of women in my life. That I've now, had... please specify, they're not all short. Right? No. Okay. But I'm thinking in particular of three prior to my marriage. And and I will include Carrie in this. I sincerely and humbly apologize for the damage I wrought upon you as I tried to figure out how to be me. Because it wasn't intentional. And I loved you. But I am sure you are still to this day recovering from the experience of being with me. <laughs> for that, I apologize. Wow. We just went there. <laughs> you know what? I don't think there's anything else that needs to be said on this anymore. Um, plus, we have the interview to supplement. But our next song is the last song on the album, and it is my favorite song in this album. Uh, this is the way you end an album. This is how you do it. Ooh, could we get a, a proper coda? Oh, yeah. Uh, this kicks ass. So I'm going to let them talk about it, and we will listen. Well, speaking of callbacks, I think this is actually a good point to segue because I wrote a lot about Plan B, and, and I think what you said it gives me a, a good put, foot here is um, there was there was a line in Plan B um, that when I listened to the song, um, and I, you know pretty straightforward. I, I I used to say you were my Plan A and banked on you shouldering my weight, prolong the inevitable, um, and I almost felt like that was the opposite of the message of adhesive almost you know you're expecting somebody else to be the adhesive for you 
and holding you together and carrying your weight. And I, and I don't know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong. Um, um, I think honestly, I feel like what that is is an illustration of how you can be both people. Um, okay. Yeah. I like not. I never meant for it to be. Right. I think that's just the reality of who I was at that time when I wrote adhesive. Right. That was about a friend who I thought I was holding a relationship together. The reason why I had the breakup I did was because she was holding like me as a person together most of the time. I wasn't in therapy yet. I wasn't doing really any real work on myself. I was just kind of letting everything be out and uh, as toxic as it was all the time. Right. Um, and it's kind of funny. It almost kind of like, yeah, illustrates how you can be one of those people who's like dealing with a person who's like shitty, but sometimes you're the shitty person. And I think sometimes we're all the shitty person um, because people make mistakes and people do selfish things. And I just think, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's important to like understand that you can be both people at the same time even, mm. you know, maybe not in the same case, but like with a different person. It, um, I, I did want to note too, and I said this earlier that I was going to do this. Um, this is the song I thought sounded like four years strong because the vocal work is so tight and so and done so well. Um, you guys just work so well together in this song that I was like, this is how four years strong would do it. They put it together. They bounce off each other. They kind of blend together. Um, so that's where I was like, I know this. I've heard this before in a good way, you know, Thanks. Yeah. Um, that's cool. and, but the, the drum intro is great. And it's, <laughs> it's just a great, powerful song. To end on. Yeah. Isaac Hiller is uh, the most talented drummer. I know um, the, he's never on interviews or podcasts with us. Cause he just doesn't say much. And then the person hosting always feels bad. Um, <laughs> I'm dead serious. I think he's a um, man of few words. Man of few words, but he's a very talented musician, a very uh, just cool guy. Like very, very talented. And, like doesn't act like you know you need to care about him. You know what I mean? Like he's very down to earth and stuff about how he plays and all that. Yeah, Isaac will do the sickest shit in the world, and people will like freak out about it. Like people at shows or us in the studio will be like, "Dude, that was fucking wild." And, I mean, and he'll just yeah. be like, thanks, man. I mean, everything he recorded, um, I, 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 aside from like five songs on the record, all the other ones, he, we never heard him play the drums on those songs until we were in the studio. Um, we gave him the demos and we told him like, you know, listen to these, work on them, expand on them. If you have ideas, let us know. And he came into the studio and he just knocked it out of the fucking park. <laughs> like it wasn't a thing. Um, yeah, I mean he's yeah he's great. I'm just I'm shouting out Isaac. That's part of why I wanted the drum that drum bit in the beginning because I knew it was like his moment to be heard right in front, right in that moment. Because then people go like, yeah, the drums were really good on this album, huh? You know, um, and I want him to have that because he's really talented. <laughs> My plan A Bent on me Shouldering my head Pull on me Inevitable And never prepared For the worst case No optimist No optimist But who has ever lived And never lost a thing No optimist I will forgive myself For every false step That stupid mistake And I am Fresh Never fast Wow, it's a good way To take out a down I agree. There were a lot of really cool elements to that song, and I would have to say the kick-ass guitar solo. And the drums? The, the drums in the beginning. So there's there's a little bit of a story to that. They surely said it in the interview already, but uh, this is their opportunity because their drummer's um, pretty quiet, you know, when they do interviews and stuff, and, and he's pretty, like, laid back. He's like, yeah, yeah, sure. So they, um, they wanted to give him an opportunity to, like, actually be out and do something, so this was the song to do it. Nice. Um, but I, I, I really enjoy this song. Like this is one of those ones where I just put it in the car and I just <laughs> crank it right up. <laughs> yeah, that's the way to go. Now, that's the end of the album proper. Unless there's anything you wanted to say about this that I mm, no, you know. no, no, no. Was... Um, we're gonna listen to one more song because I mentioned it in the interview to them, and I'm gonna let my story 
be told in the interview part. So let's jump to that interview where we talk about the track Stagnancy. I did want to bring up one more song, and I'm sorry, uh, but I have a story to go with it. So it's Stagnancy, because obviously. Um, but, but, but I have a story to go with it, and I wanted to tell you guys. So um, August 17th, 2018, you and I both played a show. Um, it was in Plymouth, and it was at you know the church there. We were in the that place. Ooh, the hot one. Yeah, and yeah. No and you guys What? No AC, baby. Yeah, that was it. That was it. So we had just gone on. We we'd finished. I, it was either I think somebody was no recall or something. We're, we're, no they recall. were in between us. Yep. Um, and then you guys you guys played, and I'm in the pit, and um, you guys played your whole set, and I think this was your last song. And everyone lined up on either side of the room, waiting for the, the big buildup of the song. And we ran into each other at that point in time. I got hit in the face. <laughs> and I got a nosebleed. Oh, my God, Aaron. <laughs> oh, no. Um, so I was so upset because it was my favorite my favorite Fairview song at the time. Um, and I was just getting ready for the song. And I'm sitting there with my nose covered in blood. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to tell you that story. Um, so I fit, played one of my last shows ever with my band and then got a nosebleed the same night. So thank you guys for that. Um, wow. But, <laughs> Full but, circle. Um, but like I said before, I love songs that talk about places I know about. And I go to school in Boston, so I take the train every single day. So I had this song on my playlist because I'd get from Quincy. And I wouldn't go all the way to Alewife, but I'd get I'd be at Quincy. I'm like, hey, this is the same train. This is totally the hey, same I'm, the, I'm in Quincy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I go yeah. This train's going to Alewife. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, um, I, I don't know if there's anything else you want to mention about that song, but I, I just really wanted to tell you that story. Um, All right. Um, yeah, man. I mean, just that with that song, I just think it's cool that people like it so much. That's all. Yeah. Um, you know, it was just a song that like we made. I don't think we ever thought of it as like a cool, cool song. It's like if people know us at all, they know that song. Like that right. song's more popular than we'll ever be. It's amazing. Um, <laughs> But it, no, it's really, it's just cool. I just appreciate people that are still like listening to what we make and stuff, you know, even if it's not the new stuff. I just think it's cool. Feigning independence, caught a train, ignored your message, drove from Quincy to Alewife and back again. In my inside, oppressing my coffee, my sig in the head. I can't get when I act like I don't need them. Sometimes I wish I saw myself from your point of view, but then. If you called it quits, I'd go fuck yourself. I'm afraid I wouldn't be able to blame you. Oh, man. I really feel like uh, I identify with these guys in so many ways. And I know it feels weird being 47 and saying that, but like this brings me back to being a 20 year old. And that's why I appreciate sharing this with you because I know there we have similar, we've discussed it before. We have similar experiences that I think if I feel a certain way about something, I know that you'll feel similarly. So when I was like, oh, this album's kick ass, I'm like, I think Chris is going to like this because he's probably going to feel the way I did. Yeah. It speaks to me, which is what you want in right, music. Right. If I can't relate to something, then I don't care. You know, it, it, and it sounds selfish, but the reality is, is what it's in it for me. Like, that's the whole purpose of the consumption of music, right? Um, so, but that's the fear of you. Check them out. Um, I can't remember. Oh, I gave them the opportunity to talk a little bit about some other people that are putting out some uh, music right now because they didn't have anything of their own um so they mentioned that um anyone anyway just put out a single a local band and so did right. bicycle in um i can't remember bicycle in single name i think it's poor lakes camp or something oh it's um, uh they did the um it's cool brett or yeah like it's cool Brett. so check out bicycle in um that's what the fair view wanted to pass on they'll also say it in the interview if you watch it on there but check out the fair view man if you haven't listened to them Take the time out of your day to do it um, and support them in the best way possible. Streaming's a horrible thing. Go to Bandcamp, uh, thefairview.bandcamp.com, listen to their stuff, download their stuff. It supports their art. It supports the artist way more. Oh, so it's uh, Poor Lakes Camp. Poor Lakes Camp. What did I say? I, Poor Camp's Lake? Is Poor that what Camp's I said? Yeah, you were close. Uh, so I was close. Um, with that being said, 
Our next episode is a special one. It certainly is, especially to us. We've come a long way, baby, to quote, um, I forget which cigarette company that was their slogan for. We Virginia are, Slims. Virginia Slims. Well, we are going to be breaking a little bit of schedule, and you're going to hear from us a little bit sooner, and that is going to be on Monday. Yes, because Monday marks the one-year anniversary of this uh, wild and strange trip we've taken, mm, which le- <laughs> led us to many hours of sitting and listening to each other's music, um, a desperate search for Fawn Batherton, uh, and uh, exposure of our uh, MK Ultra roots. Many. Empty bottles of beer. Many empty bottles of beer. Or just beverages, for that fact. A show where nobody wears pants. Um, many, many things have happened in the journey from February 8th of 2020, before there was this... BC, I mean, before COVID. Before, <laughs> I mean, COVID was out there, and there were other parts yeah. of the world that were suffering. But here, we were still under the impression that life was normal. Mm. Um so, yeah, uh, that's going to be our very special birthday episode. Yeah, so stick around for that. We'll have some surprises up our sleeve for that. I don't think we should give away yet what we're going to be talking about, but Not you should definitely stick around and listen to that when it comes out on Monday. Um, yeah. But that does not mean that we won't be back on Wednesday with our normal routine, and we're going to be listening to Royal Blood by the band Royal Blood. Their eponymous album. Yeah, and I want to point out that this that'll be a... Um, a little bit more into that loud, laid back and heavy uh, genre. That the, the thing I wanted to explore. This is really where I wanted to start with it was with them, but we got Cleopatra a little sooner, so that's what we're gonna do. So we'll be starting that little series of stuff um, with my albums with Royal Blood. Okay. So a lot to look forward to, and a lot to get excited about. And you should be listening to Esoteric of the Podcast wearing your very own Esoteric of the Podcast T-shirt. Yes, and don't forget. To stop by esotericofthepodcast.com for where you can find all our content, including our free form Fridays. That's true. And links to our social media. Uh, hopefully, uh, before too long, you'll start seeing some exclusive content on our YouTube channel. So uh, make sure to check it out. Uh, well, as always, uh, we want to appreciate you taking the time out of your day, week, month, year, moment of whatever you are doing to listen to two small time podcasters talk about a amazing album that we have no credibility to talk about right and hopefully the album has resonated with you hopefully one or two of the things that we have said have resonated with you and hopefully you'll be back next week so until then stay esoteric mm-hmm.